Welcome to Silent to Humans, um, Harlem TV webinar with uh, our CEO, Julio Taylor, and brand consultant, Matt Davies. Um, before we open the floor to, to get their thoughts, I just want to give you a very quick agenda um, so you've got an idea of the types of thing that these guys will be talking about. Uh, obviously, you've all seen the, the market messages to, uh, to make you aware of this event. Um, we're going to be talking about why the, the heart buys and the mind justifies and what makes you want to buy a product, but more importantly, what makes your customers want to buy a product as well. Um, so we'll kick it off with the art of rational messaging being lost in the new digital world. We'll talk a little bit about the art of persuasion versus persuasion, persuasion, sorry guys. Uh, and then we've got a cool little advert to show you midway through. Finish up with principles, emotional storytelling, brand storytelling, and robots versus humans. Um, so I'd like to initially open the open the floor to to um, to Matt Davies. Matt, welcome. Um, oh, great to have you. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having us and for putting this on. Um, it's a it's a real honour to be alongside you, Julio. So uh, I'm excited about some of the things we're uh, we're going to touch on today, and hopefully we'll bring some value to to the audience. So hello everyone. If you don't know me, I'm Matt Davies. I'm a I'm a brand and strategy consultant. Um, I just thought I'd kick off with a little bit around how um, at least I see brand, and I know Julio, you share very similar ways of looking at it, because I think it will play very much into what we're about to talk about. So I like to start off with definitions, because as soon as someone hears like brand, they think, oh, that's just a logo and some fonts, right? And, uh, and obviously, I have a different approach to things than just a veneer. Um, so I see brand as the meaning that people attach to you and your offer, okay? So your brand isn't just your logo, it isn't it isn't even just your website. It's, it's far bigger than that. Um, and what that definition actually does is it scares some people because it says, technically, it's you don't kind of own your brand. Your brand exists in the hearts and minds of other people, in the hearts and minds of your audience. And so what I help businesses do, they tend to, tend to be CEOs do, is help to align their people around what that meaning needs to be to get them to wherever they need to go. So it's branding is the management of meaning and marketing, which we're going to talk a lot about today is obviously a part of that, but it isn't the only part because marketing is kind of like how you attract people to buy ultimately from you. Um, and obviously there's loads of, there's loads of stuff in that bucket, but also if you think about it, the meaning that you, that people attach to you comes from many, many things, including the products that you sell, including how you go about your business, where you source your materials from and all that stuff. Um, so it's a big subject. But today, I think we're going to dive into the marketing side. And um, Kieran, you asked me to sort of open up around this idea of the rational message, um, you know, kind of being lost in the world of digital. And I think, um, I think really what the way I see it is that the brand is very, very strategic. Um, and marketing can become very tactical. There's an overlap between the two. But perhaps I think what, what digital ha has enabled us to do after the last sort of 15 years, really, over the last 15 years as marketeers, is to, to really home in and focus on audiences and to really push out specific messages to specific uh, customer groups. And of course, there's, there's some benefit in that. But the, the problem, I believe, anyway, that has happened is, is we've kind of, as an industry, completely started to focus on the algorithms, on the SEO, on the, on the keywords, on all the techie stuff, which sounds great. But the problem is then is once we've, once we've sort of um, marketed and sold through the algorithm, through the robots, we've almost started to lose sight of, of the fact that actually it's not about the robots, right? It's about humans. So, so we can, we, the robots, you know, are there, they, they, they help us. And, and you know, I'm, I just got to be careful here because I know I'm, I'm talking with the CEO of a, like a digital marketing agency, one of the best in, in the Midlands, just say that just to get on his good side, of course. But <laughs> the point, the, the reason why I'm saying that is because uh, I know, Julio, you, you also feel the same way that like we maybe have swung too far into the tech and, and the human side, which we're going to talk about today, uh, perhaps needs, needs, needs leveling back up. What do you think? That was a good intro. I don't think I can follow that up. Ah. Um, yeah, I completely agree. Um, we, we, we had a, um, a similar session a few weeks ago um, where we spoke about a similar topic. And, and we talked about um, this thing that 
it's kind of ironic, but branding has a branding crisis in itself, right? Like the, the, the whole word of brand is, is misunderstood and mis, misused quite often. And I think, and I think, um, I don't know if it's wise or even our place to, 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 to focus too much on redefining what it means, but I think it's important for us to apply it well beyond what people think it is. Right. So, um, you know, the, the, the the problem is um, it's it's very easy to sound nebulous when you talk about brand, right? It's very easily to, to it's very easy to say stuff like meaning and purpose and, and people are like, oh, here we go again. Like, what does yeah. that actually mean? How do you do that for a manufacturing company or whatever? But what, what people tend to forget is that a feeling or a meaning, meaning can also be value. It can be safety. It can be, it can be lots of things, right? I often give the example of um, Ryanair is a great example of a brand that I think is nailed. The fact that when you look at it, it looks cheap. It looks under cons considered, uh, and that's part of its value proposition. It's it's part of its appeal. The reason why it's a cheap airline is because it looks like a cheap airline, and vice versa, right? I would say I would say that the brand leads the price rather than the other way around. But that isn't immediately obvious, and I think that that is something that that I think deserves more attention. And I think the, the second point is uh um, we have a whole segment on this i think today is is i think the better we got at targeting and data and and isolating our target audience and being able to very easily decide who we can speak to the less the more lazy we became at how we talk to them and the, the, the less consideration that we put into messaging and and uh, and how it makes people feel and, and that's the same for uh, advertising as much as true to advertising as it is for web. I think web is another example. If you want to get, you know, what's good UX, just think about what the customer wants and it should be no different with advertising and with, uh, with brand. Definitely. No, absolutely. Absolutely. It's almost like, um, it's, it's, it's almost like we almost thought, well, we've done our job, right? We've got people to the site. We've, we've, we've caused them to, to click on that, that, you know, that, that conversion rate, uh, kind of button and we've got them through but as you say we forget what they feel like and also I think if we if you if we have that if we if we have too much of a focus in regards to the numbers and the and that side of things the problem is is that it, we can become very short-term focused like we can yeah we you know if you dropped all your prices you know by 50 percent and uh, you you put a, a ton of PPC adverts out there and you were 50 percent lower than the rest of the market great but if that's not sustainable longer term, if you, you know, then, then you have no business left at the end of it. So how do you build the value long term? How do you build the trust? How do you build the, um, the, the audience that will actually um, kind of help actually grow your business long term? Then I think that's when these sort of fluffy phrases like purpose and meaning um, actually become quite helpful when you take that longer term yeah. view. And when you're trying to also not just look at it as a marketing thing, when you're also thinking about how you're going to align your people and the customer experience and how, um, you know, you employ people and, and the experience you give them, once you unite that with everything, because it's all kind of connected to this idea of brand, then you've got a long-term strategic view of which marketing is just part of that overarching, almost business strategy. I think brand strategy yeah. should inform business strategy. So I agree. And, and Kieran, I'm not sure how, um, how this fits into where, you, where we are at the moment with the, um, in the agenda, but one of the things that we talk about at Hallam a lot is, is the fusion of precision and persuasion and, and, and how it's not when you do both that you get good results. It's when you're able to combine them correctly. It's, it's the overlap between precision and persuasion that, get, that gets results. And that, that's as true as, uh, you know, it's true both for uh, things like advertising and PPC and social media, as much as it is for web and creative and design and, and brand identity. And, and it's that fusion between being able to precisely choose who is the audience with the persuasive components of what makes something good, makes some, you want to buy something. One good example of this is a, is a brand that I, that I love, um, but also they're one of our clients, um, 200 Degrees, the coffee brand. And they're a, they're a brand that I, I adore, and I adore them because they are absolutely true to their principles and to their values, but they've also created something that is difficult to copy because it's unpredictable. 
uh, but there's so but but there's such a fluidity to the way that the brand exists that you couldn't really put your finger on what it is that makes people love that brand. But those guys are opening coffee shops on the same streets as Starbucks, and people go to those stores because I love the brand because there's something that is difficult to explain. That is a feeling actually. That isn't the product. It's not the price. It's not the name of the product. I don't think. There's something else, and that something else is what brand is. And and I did a bit of work with them last year, trying to codify what is what is it. Why do people choose you? And and actually, the answer. And, and obviously, this you know, it's no surprise. It's actually a combination of virtually everything, from the way that the the roasting happens to 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 the organic way in which the creative is done. All of it combined is is the brand. It isn't the logo. And actually, we did a lot of work with them, which you could consider to be brand work. We didn't touch any of the creative. We didn't touch the logo. Didn't touch the colors. That isn't actually it. So yeah, yeah. Kieran, hopefully that's like that. that's given you a decent intro, Kieran. Yeah. You're gonna have to rein us in because you know what we're like. I mean, you've yeah. uh, you you both put me out of a job. You've already covered the first two, the gender thing, and we haven't even finished <laughs> the intro. But... You said to Kieran, folks, before we started, Kieran was like, "Right, you know, we've got this like rough structure," and I was like, "Well, me and Julio, we're probably just going to ignore it. If, if you know, no offense, <laughs> it's not that we intend to be rebellious. It's just we've got issues. Um, but no, no. In terms of in terms of what you're saying, Julio, you're absolutely right. A lot of my work, um, you know, I have a creative background, design agency background, and um, you know, as, as time went on, I realized that it wasn't this veneer, as everyone almost perceives it to be. It's a lot, it's a lot more embedded in a business. And usually yeah. I find it, it actually starts with the leadership of a business, right? So, so if they understand um, where they want to go, why they exist, who they exist to serve, and why it matters, that is the key. Because if every, and, and I, th I would argue everybody in, the, in a business really needs to understand why this matters, why we're shipping this product, what difference this makes in the world, what we're trying to build here, our vision for the future, our, use a catchphrase, like purpose. Um, and if it's just there to make loads of money, right? Well, that's not very inspiration for anybody. You know, no one's going to get excited about you making money. Um, you might, but no one else will, right? But if you can say, well, no, no, we're shipping this product because it's going to help people make better um, decisions. It's going to, you know, look after single single mums and help them bring up their kids in a way that is more fulfilling. Suddenly now, oh, that sounds like something I could get behind, you know? So, um, so you'd attract better employees, your employees are more motivated, and then your marketing can actually start telling that story. And so it's much more emotive and much more exciting. So I think really what we're talking about here, Julio, is, is about creating, um, from a marketing perspective, a feeling, an emotion. We're talking about the human element that sometimes we can miss in our sort of scramble to get our message or to get our product out. We actually kind of forget what, what it is this product is all about and why is it exciting and why is it good and what yeah. was broken in the world to cause us to make this. Yeah. I think I think one of, one of the things that um, is a constant battle in all digital industries is whichever side you sit in, whether it's the persuasive or the or the precision side, we have a duty to explore the other side, right? Yeah. And that and that is that is the the thing that we all, all you know and you know coming from a branding agency background, um, at times you guys would have had a situation where you you weren't aware enough of the SEO implications of work that you did or you know and so on. And likewise, with, with, with data-led agencies, you can become very, um, very tone deaf to the to user. So the, 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 there's a few principles, you know, what one, obviously the, the topic for this, for this talk was about selling to humans. And, and there, is, there are a few principles that we, that we follow that are very fundamental and they're not a trade secret. They are, in my opinion, they should be the opposite of a trade secret. They should be the way everybody operates because that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what creates a good experience, right? The first, the first foundation of that is we are in the age of the digital uh, native. And that means that there are very few people online who don't know what good looks like when they use an app, whether it's Netflix or wherever it is. And the number of, um, the amount of millennials or younger who are now in the B2B workforce is 55% approaching 70% within the next three years. It's a, it's a huge generational shift um, of, the, of the population. So what that means is that the expectations of users are higher than they've ever been. 
And what that means for brands is that simply explaining what your product does is not enough. It's going to make people feel something. It's going to make people feel like it's a good deal or that it's, or that it's well built or that it's something. But the simple explanation and, and leading with this rational marketing of saying 50% off or next day delivery, that is not enough. And what's happening is expectations are rising. Brands are getting smarter to, to what clients want. Um, it's, 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 it's a sort of arms race that is very difficult to, to stay. It's, it's very difficult to stay, uh, to keep up the pace unless you've got a framework. And that framework is exactly what brand is about. It's about, it's about being able to crystallize and very easily articulate what is it that you do and what, who is it for and why is it valuable. And that's the key. That's the difference. And, and if you have that right, your campaigns become more effective. Your websites become more effective. Even the way that you answer the phone becomes more direct and more, effect, more effective. And that is at the core of what, when we talk about selling to humans, that's what we're talking about is what is the framework? What are, what are the building blocks around which you can more or less reconfigure and do the next thing that you've got to do within the parameters of what your brand means? Mm. Yeah. How, do you, how do you get? The, sorry, the big sorry, question sorry, is... Matt, I'll, um, oh, no, I'm, just I'm just going to um, pause there because I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that we're starting to get into the emotional stuff now. And um, what I really want to do is just just recap uh, for, for the audience um, and just basically, you know, say, say where we're up to. So we've, uh, you, Matt, thank you, covered a little bit about the, the rational message and why that's important and, and Julio, um, a little around the persuasion versus the precision element. Um, one of the things um, which, which really got me then was, um, you both touched on it as about obviously marketing to that person and, and using that emotional uh, message uh, to market to that person. Um, and almost seeing it as as not marketing to the masses, you know, marketers nowadays are so uh, in this in this mindset of we need to hit, we need to reach this sector, or we need to reach this job title, and there's the person behind the screen which you're actually marketing to. Um, and I think Google uh, does this really well with with one of their their adverts, which which I'll start now, which will give us a good segue into talking about the the principles of emotional storytelling as well. So if I can just share my screen with everyone. Um, first off, before we jump into the um, the advert, um, here's the the social media tags for for this session, uh, guys. So anyone watching at home, if you if you hear these two say anything half decent, <laughs> you could uh, pop it on social for us. Um, the tags are at Hallam Agency, uh, obviously for 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 our company. Uh, Julio is at Julio Taylor, and Matt is at Mr. Matt Davies. Uh, with the hashtag of selling to humans as well. Um, I'll leave that up for, for just a little second so you just can catch a glimpse of it. And uh, what we'll do now, we'll move on to the, the Google Loretta advert. Hey, Google. Show me photos of me and Loretta. <laughs> Remember, Loretta hated my mustache. <laughs> Remember, Loretta loved going to Alaska and scallops. Show me photos from our anniversary. Remember, she always snorted when she laughed. Play our favorite movie. Remember, I'm the luckiest man in the world. Come on, boy. Now, if anyone is still watching and doesn't get those tingles in the back of the neck watching that, or truly really understand what emotional storytelling is, that is exactly it. 
Um, Julio, you put me onto this to this advert um, originally. What just what was your what were you thinking when you first seen this? I think it's one of the most powerful um, ads I've ever seen, and um, what's really the reason why I think it's an incredible example of what we're talking about is that what we're actually selling here. What are we actually selling? Actually, <laughs> what what are we selling? We're selling artificial intelligence are we selling the box that it comes in which is the, the you know the google home is it the is it the convenience it's difficult to say right what we're doing is we what it's using it's using an incredibly powerful story of, of a person who might you know may or may not be losing their memory we don't know it's implied um it, it's creating an incredible powerful story that as it develops you begin to see you begin to unravel more and more layers of what actually is going on to to sort of close the circle into something that is a, an incredibly powerful ecosystem of data of of, of uh, reminders of machine learning of convenience of all kinds of things in a way that reaches the mind more powerfully than any product description could ever do so if we try to sell this thing um, by saying it's a machine learning algorithm that goes in a box and you can put it in your kitchen and you can talk to it that, that it would never have the same effect what we've got now is a is a perception of of uh, proximity to somebody who's no longer here through the medium of technology and that is an impossible story to tell unless you use emotion so i think it's a really powerful example of, of what is you know for businesses uh, voice search and, and artificial intelligence and machine learning is a is an advertising tool for users. It's a method of convenience, um, all packaged into one minute of um, incredibly powerful storytelling. So I think it's it's a really great example of every brand can learn from what Google did in that on that ad um, to be able to tell their story. And not everything has to be emotional in the sense that it 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 stirs you. There are different types of emotions. Humor can be one, uh, but I think uh, the main takeaway from that is is how you can package a million things into maybe fifteen words or you know twenty words or something. Yeah, I think I, th I would agree with that one hundred percent. Like it's so emotional, isn't it? And the reason why, um, you know, we talked about branding. Well, my my definition of branding being like the management of meaning the best way to manage meaning is through stories. Like stories are the way that we as humans kind of see the world, right? So we see ourselves within our own story. We have a sort of pre-written story of ourselves that the psychologists tell us that that's in our brain. And, you know, the, the emotion comes because we can't help ourselves, but we put ourselves in that story, right? And I, I'm watching that, I'm thinking like, is this gonna be me when I'm sort of older? you know, or, or yeah. whatever it is. So you put yourself in it. And so what that ad does is it does, it, the golden rule, I would say, is it, it shows what could be. It tells a story, a perfect story arch. So the beginning, you don't really know what's happening, right? There's, um, there's kind of uh, this before the change, like, what, what is this? And then as you go through the ad, it's, it's showing you the middle, which is then when we kind of, um, he's making the change. So he's adding these things into, um, into the system. And at the end, he's got after the change because it's kind of like he's incredibly lucky. So you've got like a, a mini story within that, which then also when you zoom out, suddenly the audience is thinking this, there's a bigger thing here. Like you said, like he's losing his memory, maybe, or, or who's Loretta? And, you know, there's all these questions, but and that evokes all these these emotions. But ultimately, it then helps us understand what the big picture is, what the problem is that this technology is going to solve. And, and you're right. And there's also another element, which I've just uh, Florence on the chat, who's actually oh, yeah. my sister-in-law at Florence. Ah, hi, Florence. Um, pointed out, actually, I can't help but think that there's an exploitative edge to the ad, right? And I, and I think it's, I think it's, um, it's a good point because, because there is a, a real privacy issue when it comes to things like sharing your personal memories with a machine. God knows where that data is going, right? And if you, if you put aside the ethics for a minute, what Google are trying to do with this ad also is humanize the technology so that it isn't scary, so that it isn't a, you know, a, so that it becomes something that you can love to some extent, or you can relate to, or you can associate with love. 
and it's not just a machine that gathers all your stuff and then eventually harvests you for profit which is the fear that may, people may have when they think about stuff like that so it's a conscious effort by google to humanize the technology that is what the ad is about it's not about selling that thing isn't really uh, in fact my understanding is that google tend to set, sell that technology at a loss because they're more interested in the data than they are in the, in the, in the service but it's an attempt to humanize a product that otherwise is tainted by uncertainty or fear or distance from what it's actually intended to, to achieve. They're trying to help you build a, a relationship with the brand based on the human element, yeah, right? Exactly. And, and, and I think to sell to humans, you have to talk to them like humans. Yeah. That's, that's basically it. Right. And um, I did a lecture into you a little while ago talking about this exact topic. And, and there was a slide that, that I had on there, which I've just pulled up. And it says our brains are hardwired to seek reward from emotional responses. So our, our brains are built to look for reward from emotion, joy or um, nostalgia. We are built to seek those responses. So the, the goal of evolution should always be that when you're, when you're trying to sell to humans, and I would really love to see an example of where you're not selling to a human because every person who makes a decision is a human right now, at least I think so. So there is, there is always a space to connect with that person on a, on an emotional level. That emotion may vary from, you know, sentimental types of emotions like the one we just saw, but it may also be safety or, or reassurance or the perception of value or, whatever that happens to be like another, uh, you know, we were talking, Kieran and I were talking earlier about the Twitter breach yesterday. And what does that have? What impact does that have on your perception of, uh, of brand? Right. Another example of that is uh, Hermes, the um, delivery company, right? They have this habit. They send you an email when they've got your package. Right. And the emotion that I get, I'm like, Oh God, they've got my package. That's terrible. Like that makes me worry because I've had really bad experiences with them in the past. Right. So, the brand building elements of what people feel when they hear your name or where they think about your brand is more important. It is as important as the product itself or the service itself. And in some cases more important. And that's why they have to be balanced. They're they have both. To, they have to incredibly... link with the reality, don't they? You know? Yeah. So, so I often, you know, think as well, it's not just about the story we put out. It's about the stories that, that our audience or our, I call them our tribe, tell about us. And if we truly, genuinely want to help other humans, then they will begin to tell those stories amongst other people like them who have the same problems and challenges. Yeah. And that yeah. is the key to create those experiences to allow that tribe to, to thrive. Um, yeah. I just wanted to throw another sort of um, study into the mix here. I don't know if you've heard, Julio, of... Um, of Dr. Paul Zak. I use his uh, work sometimes in, in, in some of my work. He basically is a neuroscientist. And um, what's really interesting is he did a load of studies. Um, they took uh, a group into, um, into the study. They took blood samples, right? Then they played them um, a story of um, a really sad story, really emotional story, not too dissimilar to the one that we've just seen, but about a terminally ill child, right? And his father, really really ill, really tragic. Anyway, um, when the participants come out of the study, they took blood samples again, and then they gave them the opportunity to give the money that they were going to be paid for being part of the study to a charity related to the terminal illness. And what's fascinating about the study is that they could tell, based on the amount of cortisol and oxytocin, I believe, in their blood that they'd taken out, the rise in that, how by about 80% accuracy, whether that person was going to donate or not. So what that so shows us is that a story told to the right person, and you know, it gets a bit scary when we talk about manipulation, but the point is, is that it, it can actually make a massive difference to the behavioral change. Yeah, um, absolutely. And it but I think, I think that, that reinforces the, 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 the point that design and creativity comes with great responsibility. Massive. And and um, manipulation i mean you know it's sad to say but every successful propaganda campaign in history no matter how nefarious was driven by a great designer yeah. and and that's because of the, the power of brand and storytelling and 
and messaging. And it's no surprise that the most successful and memorable political campaigns, and I won't get into which one, but you know which one I'm thinking, is three words. It's always three words, three simple words. And they are memorable and repeatable and you will remember and it and it is meaningful and it all it's it always it's always like that and that is exactly what branding is so the problem is you try and counter that with carefully considered fact factual arguments that make sense no one remembers that and the, and, and that's the, and the same exact thing applies to to business and you know you you, you can think about um you know famous uh, slogans from history that we still remember today, even though the products may not even exist. Um, it's very much like that. There are many stories. Many yeah. stories. Yeah. One thing that um, that you both picked up on, and, and I think, uh, Matt, you mentioned it when you were talking about the, the blood tests, is obviously there's that, uh, that human change, which makes people think differently. I think for, for the attendees, it'd be great. Um, and I'll, I'll open this question to both of you is, um, do you have any more practical advice for, for telling emotional stories and, and changing your brand into that emotional perception, which will allow those, those changes in people? Do you have any uh, sort of top tips or advice at this point for, for the people watching? I think you need to speak to the human that is making the decision, not the company. I think that's, that's what, you know, what, one thing that you're seeing at the moment is um, Google is making a over years and it's this is this hasn't stopped. It's been going for a long time now. It's beginning to shift its its approach to SEO so that it relies more on natural language processing. This is partially allowed by technology being able to being able to comprehend intent and being able to comprehend um, language. But SEO itself is no longer just about making sure you have the right keywords on your homepage. It's, it's about context. It's about uh, tone. It's about all those things. So practical means speak like a human, behave, you know, talk online and talk in your marketing and your messaging to the people who are buying your products, not the organization who's going to use it. And I think that, you know, for example, um, you might be a, I don't know, like, um, like another, I'll give you one example. So we have a, we have a company, a client who manufacture high end windows, um, and doors. Uh, and when we did the work with them, we, we were trying to think like, okay, how do you talk about a window or a door in a, in a meaningful way? Like that's, that's, you know, it's first of all, a door and a window are very difficult to photograph because they're made of glass. So you can't actually see them most of the time. So we, we decided to think, and we figured that actually the reason you would spend good money on a good window that's big and um, is because you want light in your house. You want daylight in your house. Okay, so why would you want to do that? And it's because you want to enjoy your spaces with your family, with your friends. It's about uh, a certain type of lifestyle. So all of our messaging went away from just glass and steel towards creating a, a living space, towards creating lifestyle, towards creating happiness and it became more of a daylight and happiness company and then it began began to talk about it began to talk to specifiers and architects and, and and end users about the joys of you know spacious open living and, and so on which now actually with covid has become incredibly important because people stay home so that's a good example of like where you don't talk about the product you don't talk about the glass you don't talk about the the, the wood and the aluminium and all the bits are going to make these products. We talk about the outcome of using it. And that exact argument can be applied to B2B. There's a real myth that B2B brands don't need to be spoken to like consumers. And that's not true. And there's, there's lots of research that shows that, but actually um, it, 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 it's also true that uh, Matt talked about this the other, the other week on, on LinkedIn about human to human. There's no such thing as B2B or B2C. It's just human to human. They just happen to have different needs. And what you need to do is focus on those needs and so on. So before, before I give the floor to Matt, there's a couple of things that come up, came up in the chat that actually refer to what, what we're talking about now. Yeah, one from Rebecca White's uh, question was about how do you apply emotional intelligence to professional services, which is often a grudge purchase, something like insurance or legal. And I think you touched on it then where you're referring to the aspirational lifestyle that that person gets once they've purchased it, but it'd be good to, to get your thoughts on that, Leo. Yeah, I think, I think um, uh, that's a really good question, Rebecca. I would say every purchase 
is 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 driven by a need or or a desire both of both or all of those things are driven by emotion of some sort so I, i've got quite a bit of experience in fact working in the legal sector and we worked with a couple of legal firms where we realized that where when you're buying legal products legal services from this specific uh, practice because of their set of uh, services they basically do everything except for criminal law they do everything else so we said there are probably two types of two types of people who are going to buy these services there are going to be people who don't who 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 are looking who know what they want like they may want some uh, will or they might want you know uh, to buy a house and they're looking for the right legal firm to to help them pick to to help them do it and then there are people who are just in trouble and they just need help with a very specific problem in both cases what they're looking for is reassurance they're looking for support they're looking for eye contact with somebody who they be, believe they can trust they they're looking for an escape from the baseless uh and sometimes uh um intimidating persona that law firms may have so we focused on the and we we did a lot of user research and user mm -hmm. testing and we began we, we began to understand that people who are in trouble who need a legal um service want a certain type of emotional response safety reassurance speed convenience and people who don't have an emergency are looking for prestige um they're looking for reputation they're looking for credibility caliber which is a different different set of emotions but both of those are just as applicable as me walking to an apple store and just needing to buy an expensive apple product because I'm a sucker for it and I just love it it's just as valid it's just a different type of emotional response but it's just as valid so i would say there are very few things that you can sell to a person that does not involve an emotional response of some sort it could be simplicity or it could be um maximum convenience it could be it could be all kinds of things even amazon's got a a very carefully calculated emotional response to its buying journey and that is that you click on one button somehow that toothbrush that i just bought will arrive tomorrow and somehow i paid 2 pounds for it how is that even possible i don't know but it happened that's the value right it's not the toothbrush or the, or anything else so that's a long-winded response but um but that's that and 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 I'll add one last thing Matt I promise and I'll, I'll let you talk now uh Hamza asks a really good point or how do we ensure precision when using emotions when communicating um no actually that wasn't it it was on before talking about covid right covid is a good example of connecting with humans actually i think covid has accelerated and it has zoomed in on the need to connect on an emotional level i think it's 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 made a lot of brands realize that the hard sell no longer works and the main difference between traditional advertising and uh, or traditional marketing and modern digital marketing is that for the first time in history you are able to penetrate people's homes when they are already doing things that where they don't expect to be advertised to right you're intercepting their family conversations on facebook you're intercepting their viewing of peppa pig repeats on youtube like i have to do every morning and you're interrupting daily life all over the place across every channel imaginable in a way that before was very difficult to do because now it's hyper targeted it's hyper relevant it's on demand it's instant and that calls for a much more cons cons uh, considerated a way in which you communicate you can't be a hard salesman it's a bit like walking into a meeting room and just throwing flyers and leaflets at people randomly and shouting about your products and no one no one's going to engage with you they're going to engage with you if you have a conversation you ask them about their needs and you begin to develop a relationship in that way so i would say every type of business needs to have a conversation with the people who are buying their product and service that conversation will change depending on their need but uh, we need to separate the word emotion from sentimental value they're not the same thing when we mean emotion we also mean fear we also mean um haste whatever that you know whatever that may be that yeah um well just going back to the uh the question which i believe was like what are our thoughts on how you could start to shift the focus and start telling an emotional story um 
I guess it really depends where you are in the business. But I mean, my, my sort of standard response to that is, look, this is no simple thing, right? Because you have to do it in an authentic way. There's no silver bullet here. We can't just be like, oh, just, just put out loads of like nice stories and your business will be transformed. Because yeah. as I sort of started off with at the beginning, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a bigger thing than that, right? It's not just a lick of paint. Um, so what is it? Well, I, I believe it has to be something that's really deeply rooted in the culture of the business. And that is a massive challenge if you're not there already. Like some of the projects I'm working on are, are sort of like, I'm working on one at the moment, we're six months in, and we're gonna be two, three years in terms of our plan to deploy a change, a step change in the business to go from just selling products to selling outcomes, right? So it's not quick and it's not super simple, but how do you do it? Very easily, uh, well, very easily, very, very simple explanation in my, in my view is, number one, you have to take some time out with the leadership team, right? It ha in my view, it has to kind of come from the top this direction. You have to align everybody around those big questions that we've kind of mentioned, like, why do we exist? Who do we exist to serve? And why does that matter? And the who do we exist to serve bit is absolutely crucial for you to really make a call on, make a decision on. You really, as Julio's already touched on, need to understand that type of person, your tribe, right? Yeah. And the closer you get to them, the more time you spend with them, the better not only your, your, your communications can be with them, but also in terms of actually what you're delivering for them in regards to your, your products, your operations, your customer experience. All of that can become far more valuable to them and they'll be far more willing to go to you and make a decision to buy from your brand than others. Yeah, but it's exactly. not quick. You know, it's not a quick. Exactly answer. that. And that, that was Hamza's, um, Hamza's second question was uh, related to what you just said now, because Hamza asks, um, how do you make sure we're precise when we use emotion and communicate things so that it doesn't come across as corny or missing the mark and disingenuous? The answer to that is it has to be authentic. Mm. it has to be if it's authentic it doesn't matter if you miss the mark because that is you that is authentic anything else is pretense right and in the same way that when you you know if you if you have a personal uh, engagement in a networking event or whatever you present yourself in your in the best way you can you don't you don't adopt a fake persona just to talk to somebody <laughs> it sounds complicated right like there's all these things you have to think about like authenticity and depth and so it is complicated that's the point it is complicated and, and that's why it deserves respect and it deserves time and focus and effort. It is complicated. Um, and, what, and the way to answer complexity is through a carefully built framework yeah. and, a, and a carefully built uh, playbook and a carefully built system by which you communicate. That carefully built system is your brand. Mm. that's why it's not complicated when you do have a brand because you do you know how to react you know how to greet a great example of that is john lewis why would you go to john lewis instead of amazon i mean right now probably because you'll get covid and i get that but normally why would you go to john lewis store rather than go to amazon because the way you're greeted the way that it's laid out the way that it's decorated it's consistent with a brand ethos that means premium it means uh, reassurance, it means uh, fairness, and all these different things that are all feelings. So it's a very, it's a very complex. Um, and, and, it, and, uh, and I want to throw a word in here to just agree with you. I think the word is truth, right? Yeah. So when John Lewis speak about their service and never knowingly undersold and all that stuff, yeah. it's true because they've baked that into their employees, into the systems, That's absolutely right. everything. They were, There's no shortcuts. No. They behave that way. They, exactly. There are no shortcuts. Mm. And um, I'll just pick up one more from here, Kieran, is uh, Katie Malone asks, um, does networking, in, in, as in conventional networking groups, still have a place in the sales process? There are two answers to that. One is, right now, it's difficult because of COVID, uh, but I do think that will pass eventually, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, but... There's no question that the nature of business is, has changed permanently. But I do think that networking is actually what we're doing right now, right? Between us all, we're like we're all talking and, you know, um, it's changed. I think the, the medium through which you do it is different. But one thing I can tell you for sure is that your brand is the reputation that precedes you. People are predisposed to buying from you because of your brand. 
no different to when somebody makes a personal recommendation like Matt, here's a great plumber that I used once, you know, Matt already expects that plumber at least to be honest. Otherwise I wouldn't have recommended him, right? Unless I had a grudge. So that sort of preconception um, is part of networking, right? Somebody introduces you to somebody else, you kind of know what to expect because of the recommendation. Um, I think brands and digital marketing do that in different ways. It's about, I think it's about adapting rather than replacing. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing I was going to throw into the mix here is when you get close to your tribe, um, it, 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 I think the, the future of business is very much around designing solutions with them, not simply for them, right? So the idea here is, is that once we've, we've made a, a strategic decision, we're here to serve this type of person with this type of challenge, we have a product at the moment that we think will solve their challenge, but just because it's like that at the moment doesn't mean that things are not gonna change. So to keep relevant, you think of COVID, well, the work I've been doing with my clients is, you know, this big question, how can we remain relevant, relevant to our tribe? And the answer is through listening to them and through creating with them, it's not about you, it's about them. So my, my, kind of, um, my kind of sort of thoughts on that is that you've got to design a whole ecosystem that makes them stronger, not the business stronger. The business will get stronger afterwards, but it has to create like events and processes and products and experiences that make the tribe stronger. And the tribe will keep coming back because they're not going to get that from that, that type of experience, that type of feeling from any other person or any other brand because yeah. you're here specifically focused to serve them. Um, just quickly on to touch on, on the point around professional services and business to business. Um, again, I, I, a, a thought comes to my mind. I was involved in a project a while back with a commercial property uh, company, right? They would, they would buy, you know, for very business to business kind of operation around commercial property, all the services involved in that. And, um, you know, you think, well, what, how are we selling that? So, you know, these are all our services. These are the facts. These are the figures. But ultimately, why were people coming to them? Did a lot of research, did the work. As uh, we're saying, there's no silver bullet. You have to do the work. Why, why, is, why is it that this company is, is so successful? Um, and, uh, and why have they been brought to this point? The answer was because people trusted their advice to help them. And here's the catchway, catchphrase, make a great decision right? Yeah. Now, once we stumbled into that, that became the core. Everything we're doing is helping people make a great decision. Now, that is a story, just those few words in themselves, because what that's saying is, is don't make a bad decision. There's the fear in the story. Make a great decision. Come to us. The out, it sells the outcome in just a small few words. So I kind of, we, we'll probably talk about storytelling if there's time in a minute, but oh, there's probably not. Here and smiling. No. <laughs> no, there's not. We could do another one on storytelling, but but I always think that there's sort of different levels of storytelling. Every day. There's a very short phrase for the story, but then you can also dig deeper into that from the customer's perspective to really kind of help to uh, to, to to make the tribe stronger. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, cool. that's really that's a really good point. Can I pick up one more question, Kieran? Yeah, of course. Fire away. So uh, Louise um, is asked, actually asked right at the beginning. Um, how do we feel that PR sits uh, in the strategy toolkit? Because there's quite a bit of overlap between uh, you know, PR and brand. I would say that brand feeds PR. I think right. it's the, like I said before, it's the framework of the tool set or the, you know, the, the, the kit that you can use to, to verbalize co consistently and coherently. And I think PRs have a responsibility to uphold and to amplify a brand correctly but they also have a duty, in my opinion, to challenge it when it's not being done correctly. Yeah. And I would say the greatest uh, champions of brand should be the PR advisors and PR people at companies because they are the ones that are carrying that flag and they're the ones wearing the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the reputation that we've built. So I would say they are incredibly important, but one complements the other. Um, that's, that's, I think that to me, I feel very strongly about that. And, and PR for the sake of it is, is meaningless. It's, it's when it has purpose and, and it's actually telling a story that it's useful and that story needs to come from the brand. For, for me, right, I think we've, we've set up our businesses, if I may be so bold, a little bit incorrectly, right? We have marketing and brand and all that stuff, you know, is almost sort of reporting into marketing. 
um, including PR. My view is, is that brands should be at the top. We need chief branding officers. We need people in the boardroom who, is the, who are the voice of the customer, who've done that work with the leadership team, who yeah, understand okay. yeah. it and can represent yeah. them. And marketing, sorry if there's any CMOs in the room, marketing, my view, should report into them. But that, there you go. Boom. I'll, I'll drop the mic on that and everyone can, uh, <laughs> can shoot me down later. That could, be your, that could be your main policy when you run for PM. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine? Uh, there we are. Um, yeah, no. There's, a, there's another question from, there's another real quick one here from Jenny asking, uh, they have a client who uses one social platform for B2B and another one for B2C and they're trying to strategize how to do this well or if it's confusing for the audience because of how broad the client wants to, to target. Uh, what is our take on communicating, communicating two different conversations to different audiences under the same umbrella? I would say that the brand is the common thread. doesn't matter what the audience is. There is an overarching meaning. There's an overarching purpose. Uh, there are lots of brands that, that sell to both consumers and businesses. Volkswagen is one. Mercedes is another. They've got you know expensive, sporty cars and they've sell vans, mm -hmm. right? Same brand. You can segment your audience, but there is an overarching perception of value and quality to Mercedes and Volkswagen that is common across both B2C and B2B. And um, there are lots of examples. Apple, you know, they've got business programs and, and so on. So I think uh, the consistency of message is, is, it needs to be slightly different between the two, but I do think that the perception and the meaning and the, and the, the overarching, this sort of like slightly nebulous thing that we keep talking about, uh, that is difficult to explain. It's what I, you know, the, the 200 degrees example I gave before. There are another brand actually who do business, they do uh, coffee for offices and for uh, wholesale and they have coffee shops. There is a common thread between the two that is bridged together by meaning and purpose and this desire that you have to buy from them. Yeah, I would say Jenny's got her work cut out, but it's not unusual, right? To have no. one brand that serves two tribes, right? So the key here for me is the brand story, the core, the essence, why we exist, why we get out of bed in the morning is the same. But, so that's, that's the brand strategy, but then how we articulate that to audience A with our value proposition to them might be slightly different to how we articulate that yeah. to, to audience B. But that, that's, then, a, that's a classic example of the work that you do and yeah. the work that we do at Hallam is exactly that, right? It's working with senior leaders and learning and understanding and creating a framework and helping them to be able to say, here's what we need to do next. Here's how you could do X and Y and so on. So that is actually a big, big part of the work that we, that, you know, that you do, uh, me less so now, but the work that you do and that Hallam does, which is uh, branding strategy or, or brand strategy, which is not the same as how do you go to market? It's no. how do you present yourself in the most effective way possible so that people will want to choose you? Yeah. And it starts off as a very internal thing, you know? Um, that's how I see it. It has to start from a cultural perspective, aligning the leadership, getting the, getting the leaders yeah. in the room and asking these big questions. You know, half the work I do is, is, is I get wheeled in to, to, ha to help those conversations happen in a fun kind of way so that we can get alignment. Um, so sort of brand strategy becomes the Trojan horse so that yeah. the leadership team can be aligned. Now, of course, there's research and there's other kind of more techie stuff that happens, but ultimately it happens at a, at a conversational level for leaders to say, yeah, that's where we want to go. We've made that decision and then we're going to make it happen. And then that flows from there down through the organization and of course out then to customers. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. Like knowing the story at the top and understanding what that story is can really help then going forwards with everybody. So, so I would say, get your leaders in the room, get them, get them thinking about some of these questions, get them aligned so that there's not splintered and people are not running off in different directions so that you can, uh, you can really make this happen in a meaningful way for your customers. Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a valid point. Uh, Matt and Jenny, thanks for the question. Hopefully that, that helps you out a little bit there. Um, well, before we, we wrap up, guys, I wanted to um, let you know uh, what the poll score was. So we, we sent a poll out at the start of uh, the webinar about uh, do you buy with your head or your heart? 41% of respondents said head, 59% said heart. Uh, what are your thoughts about those, those percentage splits? What do you think, Julio? Do you want to start? I've got some thoughts, but <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, 
yeah, I mean, I believe that the head, the, the heart buys and the head justifies. That's all. That's what we tend to say. Uh, okay. Hallam, the heart buys and the head convinces the heart as to whether it should be, it should happen or it shouldn't happen or has the final say, let's say. But I think there's something that when you walk into a supermarket, there's something that makes you reach for a jar or for a specific thing without thinking, right? That's always a heart. It's automatic. It's not, it's not a, a conscious, slow choice. Uh, there are cases where one, um, there are cases where one will lead the other, of course, if it's an expensive purchase, it has to be justified in different ways. Uh, but I think in almost all cases, it's led by the heart. And, and certainly when it comes to a strategy, there is something that makes you look in the first place. And I think that's where the value is. Yeah, I think yeah. That yeah, there's a lot of studies that say that we buy with our with our eyes and our emotional kind of pull towards something. And then we back that up with rational thought. So there's 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 a study about chickens that I could refer to where um, where basically there's a nice plump chicken and then a really sort of sort of more sickly looking chicken. And participants were told, well, um, the chicken that's really plump, that's a natural chicken. And they 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 kind of taste great. Um, and they're healthier. Uh, but the other one is genetically modified and they don't taste so great um, and they're not healthier. So that was to one part, one set of the participants. And then they swapped it over, right? So the big one, that, that natural chicken doesn't taste so good, but at least it's healthier. And the, the smaller genetically modified one, well, that one, um, that one, uh, well, I'm getting lost with my own thinking now. That one uh, doesn't, does, that tastes better but it's not as healthy. And then at the end, they, they said, which one do you prefer? And everyone predominantly said they preferred the one that looked better, but they justified it in a different way. One said, well, we, we think it's important that even though the other one tastes better, it's, it's healthy. Uh, that was the predominant thinking there. And the other one was, well, it, it should be because it tastes better. And so we choose taste. So the point of, of studies like that show that, and there's loads like them, I could probably reference into the cows come home, but the, the point of studies like that is tells us that we buy with our emotion, we buy with what we feel and that it looks good for us. And um, that comes from all sorts of different ways of thinking about a brand. And then we back it up with then those rational things that, that come into play. So sell to humans with emotion, that's what I'd say, not, not with facts and okay. figures. Wrap the facts and figures in a story and you've got it you've got it made it, it's a go. very interesting point about the the cost of the purchase as well and, and how much you actually have to think about it when it's a, when it's a higher purchase decision i remember uh, even buying the the latest car that i bought it was definitely a decision with my heart but i have to use my head to persuade my other half to actually buy it so uh, that's sort of but the, you see the the, the the emotional response will will change your what you're willing to pay mm. so without even realizing your what your maximum amount was probably raised when you saw the car and loved it right so that that's why first impressions and, and and the heart is so important because it changes the parameters around which the head will then decide. Yeah. Um, listen, guys, we're, we're running a little bit over. I know a few people are starting to drop off in, in the comments. I'd just like to say everyone who has attended, uh, you know, thanks very much. Hopefully you found it useful. Um, like I said earlier, if you were, if you are on Twitter, make sure you follow these two guys. That they're, they're constantly uh, posting about similar things of what we've been talking about. Um, also, if you, if you have had a sort of highlight from today uh, that, that, that someone said, please put that online and, and share with the hashtag selling to humans. Um, be, before we wrap it up, um, Julio and Matt, do you have any, any final words for, for everyone? I would, I would, I'll, I'll happily just sort of sum up. I would say, look, I think as businesses, we need to put the customer at the heart of everything we do. When we tell a story, they're the hero of the story, not us. It's about them and their challenges and their desires. So, so think about the outcome of what it is that you're trying to do in the world. Think about that on a micro scale with the little comms that you're putting out, but think of it on the big scales as well, the macro scale in terms of why you exist as a brand, who you exist to serve and why it matters. Um, and you'll find you probably, you'll be more meaningful and more fulfilled in your work and your customers will, will be more loyal, pay more and love you more. So that's my thinking. I will keep it mine really short. I would say in, in, in today's um, automated and fast society, humanity is the new premium. And that is why you need to put it at the top of your strategy, because that is the difference. Everybody else is doing the data stuff now. Not everybody's doing the human part that well anymore. And that's the premium. For sure, for sure, definitely. 
Well, thanks very much for, for joining us, Matt. Julio, always a place to talk about brands. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's a wrap, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Make sure yeah. you are telling emotional story telling from now on. Listen to your customers, listen to what they're telling you, listen to what they want, and then persuade the, the leadership team of that. Right? Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, if, if you have found us through the, the Hallam social media um, or the newsletter, we'll be doing more webinars like this in the future, so keep your eyes peeled. Um, again, Matt, pleasure. Julio, thanks for joining us. And, thanks for uh, having me. No, no, it's been a pleasure, mate. And for the rest of thanks, the, Matt. Uh, thanks a lot. the attendees, thank you very much for coming along, and we will leave it there. Peace. Bye-bye.